Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well still and welcome to, depending on however you may look at your clock or wherever you may live this middle of the night or early morning bonus upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadalny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost a cent. Click the like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to this early morning or night ending bonus upload. Today's first encounter. I swear on the highest honor I can muster that everything in this experience is true, all true, no matter how badly I wish it was not. There isn't much to do in the rural parts of Pennsylvania, what some call Pennsylvania, like most parts of rural America. Popular pastimes include drinking oneself into a stupor and driving an uninspected 1983 Ford F-150 double the speed limit down a narrow, rarely maintained road. I, however, occupy myself when I can by hunting. It gets a bad rap as barbaric, cruel practice, but I've always found solace in the forest that is impossible to find in a cramped, too-close-for-comfort atmosphere of the small town. This particular season, I was out in early November in the forest of the foothills of the Appalachian, a few miles away from my house and northwest of Harrisburg. It's late fall season, steady flow of foliage tourists, what we call leaf peepers, were beginning to trickle to a stop. Some of the trees were still burning that fiery, bright red-orange, but most were beginning to wither, foreshadowing an unusually harsh winter to come. The fall leaves created a curtain of decay which moved like a sandstorm in slow-mo, shrouding and isolating me from my surroundings and crunching softly under every footstep. I paced through the temple of red and gold, alert to the light footsteps, the white-tailed deer. My Winchester 30-06 swayed on my back as I walked. The gun was overkill for a deer, but it doesn't pay to take chances around big game like elk and black bear. This forest was new territory for me, a refreshing change of pace after paved trails and subdivisions began to encircle the hunting grounds of my childhood. As I walked, I began to lighten my guard, losing focus on the wildlife and becoming engrossed in the natural beauty of the area. I became so distracted, peering up at the falling leaves, that I tripped over a tree root snaking through the carpet. I followed it with my eyes to the termination at the base of a massive gnarled oak tree. The trunk was huge, but the tree was squat, blackened with age and split down the middle as if an act of God. This story could have ended right then and there if it wasn't for the smell that wafted up to me as I passed the tree. It wound its way up from the tree's base to a swall in the ground to the rised path I was walking on. Pushed in crisp smell of the forest aside, my first thought was dead animal, which could mean bear in the area, so I circled the tree to take a look. There was no carcass, but the scene at the base of the tree resembled a homicide. Dark matted clumps of fur dotted the undergrowth. A vicious black fluid led from the forest into a hollow, overshadowing by a titanic root leading deep into the ground. The entire picture was punctuated by the same rank smell, a thick, coppery scent like pennies mixed with death. 
I'm not unused to the gritty, even downright disturbing scenes, but this scene made me wretch involuntary, and the den unsettled me deeply, as though I had stumbled upon something no one should ever see. Shaken, I moved back onto the trail, against my better judgment, resumed my search for the deer. The sun began to beat down overhead with all the clarity of a winter's day shining and demanding light on the forest, and weakened my resolve. I just began to unpack my lunch when something began to bother me. I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but I felt antsy, for a lack of better words, like I shouldn't be sitting around here. Without even knowing it, I began to scan my surroundings, something, anything. I was returning to my lunch when it hit me. The forest was silent. No birds, no insects, nothing. Even the rustle of the trees and the wind had come to an ominous standstill. As the meaning of this rationalization began to sink in, I got to my feet. Two things happened in rapid succession. A sizable branch snapped a few hundred meters away, and an ungodly screech penetrated the November air. I never heard a sound like it before or since. It was as if the earth itself split and hell opened up just long enough to sum up the suffering of the damned in one ear-splitting roar. Terrified, I bolted my gun, leaned against a tree, and began to scan the undergrowth. Something big was moving through the forest floor, but I couldn't see what it was, thanks to the curtain of leaves falling around me. I hastily made tracks back in the direction I had come from, forcing myself not to look back. After all, what animal would actively stalk a human without even being provoked? I had lost the sound of the creature and began to loosen up a little when I was hit with a bone-chilling realization. The sounds of the forest had come back behind me, but the trees in front of me were silent as a grave. Whatever I had encountered, probably the same beast that made that mess under the oak tree, had circled back in an attempt to trap me. Truly scared at this point, I scrambled off the path into a rock gully, my back to a damp rock wall. I crawled without taking my eyes off the path into the cave, hoping to hide my hyperventilation and chattering teeth from whatever was stalking me. Only a few minutes had passed when I heard the crunching of the leaves and a deep demonic snorting. It stopped on the path above my hideaway. I held my breath, willing my heart to stop so it could be completely silent. The creature had began to move on when my gun, leaned against a rock, slipped off the slick surface. It clattered to the ground, reverberating louder than an air raid siren in a crisp autumn air. My heart sank as the footsteps made their way down the rocks closer to me. I crawled painfully slow toward my rifle, every muscle in my body tight enough to burst. I stopped to steady myself, my heart breathing, right outside the opening of the cave. It was choked, slavering breathing, unnatural, which inspired visualizations of twisted corruptions of human and beast, a patchwork demon of animal and man. I reached my gun and came to the closest to death I ever had, because as I outreached my hand, so it did. Instead of a smooth, shellic, of my rifle's stock, my palm met a coarse, ragged fur, caked with mud and attached to a lank, sinewy arm. The beast screamed, and as I shouldered my rifle and fired blindly out of the opening, I caught a glimpse of a yellowed fang and one blood-red eye. The eye that reflected more hatred than an ancient man, a hatred that said, This is my forest. You may have altered it through your presence, corrupted it, but I was here before you, and I will be hereafter. Human willpower paled in the face of such uncompromising malice, and I shrank back against the rocks, robotically cycling bullets out of the cave. I sat there, dead-eyed, doing this for a long time. Overnight and well into the next morning, over 18 hours of working a bolt and pulling a trigger, by the time I snapped out of my adrenaline-fueled haze, my mouth felt like the desert, and my fingers felt as though they were made out of canvas, stretched over dust, shaking. I reached for my water bottle and gulped it down, spilling most of it down my front, praying the beast was long gone. 
I inched my way out of the cave and ran as fast as my rickety legs would carry me the two odd miles back to my truck, leaving most of my gear there. Nothing pursued me, but the feeling of being hunted remained. I drove back to town at 80 miles an hour on a dirt road, my eyes wide with fear, my hands gripping the wheel with white knuckles. Unable to bear the thought of my secluded home, I spent the night in a motel in town with a bottle of cheap whiskey and every light on in the room. The thought of a creature would not ex exit my mind. Was it a demon, loosed on the earth by some divine mistake, or just an animal, a cryptid lost to time and the memories of trees? I don't really know, and I really don't want to know. I couldn't, I still can't let it go. The fear eventually subsided, but as I sit at home writing this, I swear, hand to God, that I can hear that howl echo through the trees and across the mountains telling me that I may never rest, never forget. Just really quick, I narrated that story about two years ago, and uh, that story has stuck with me throughout all of the encounters that I've narrated. Um, I've narrated some crazy ones. The one that happened in Delaware, uh, last year around this time, the EMT driver that was stalked with his partner. But that story has stuck with me for just a very long time. Um, I don't think it was a demon. I definitely think it was a dog man, just the way he described it. And uh, very lucky. And, you know, a lot of people, when I first narrated it, were like, Oh, 30-06, he was chambering and moving quick, and that didn't happen. Well, you know, I don't know who or what he's into, but it's possible. I mean, I've sat at the shooting range and tried, and, you know, rapidly. I mean, not as fast as a semi-automatic AR-15 or, you know, whatever. But quick enough to detour something from entering a cave. <laughs> so, I don't know. I just wanted to share that one with you again. Um, in my studio, I have a big filing cabinet with all of the encounters that I've ever narrated. But there's a couple that are right in this desk drawer. And uh, that is one of them. So I just wanted to share that with you guys again. Moving on. Today's second encounter. I was hiking at the Barton Creek Greenbelt like I do most every week. I had decided to go off the trail, which I had done many times before. Except this time I went much deeper into the woods than I had before. I was following the river when I stumbled upon a cave. It was kind of small, and I would have to crawl on my belly to go into it. And since I was alone, I decided to pass on that for the time being. Not long after, I found two more caves next to each other. These were much bigger, and I could see support beams not far inside. I approached the larger of the two and began to enter, when suddenly I saw a pair of red eyes blink from the darkness. This threw me off. I wasn't expecting to find anything there. I decided to leave whatever was in there alone. But, on my way back, I passed the cave again. Curiosity took hold of me, and I decided to enter one more time. This time I saw no eyes, so I figured the thing from before had left. I went in further, where I heard shuffling deeper in the cave. I froze. The shuffling seemed to be going away from me. I started to back out when I heard a blood-curdling, inhuman scream from the darkness. I bolted, not knowing what it was, or what it would do to me. Today's third encounter. I've always been kind of paranoid, always been afraid of stuff that really isn't that scary. And, well, it may be my personality, but it can also be that I listen to a lot of scary stories. Yeah, yeah. This doesn't matter so much, but I wanted to say this so you could understand how observant and how much I react to uncertain things. So now, that I told you that. Let's get to the experience. 
It took place in the summer of 2017. Me and my friend were camping at a little lake near her house. Okay, it wasn't that close from her house, maybe a 20-minute walk. And also, you got to know where she lives in this very wooded area. And the leading way to the camp was a very small dirt path. We had set up our awesome tent, got some snacks and some blankets, and of course our phones. Let's say that we set up our tent at 1700 and we talked and snapchatted and stuff until 2200. At that time, we realized our phones were close to dying. And as a 13-year-old girl who always needs their phones got in a panic, you see our stupid asses forgot to take with us our power banks. So we had nothing but cables and an adapter to use. And of course, we had to use our phones. Well, that's what we thought. So we decided to walk the whole way back to her house and charge our phones there. We got to her house safely, charged the phones, used the bathroom, took our power banks with us, and then went back. After our phones had charged for a while, we decided to walk back to camp. Now, this is where it gets weird. Me and my friend, we'll call her Amanda, we were walking on a normal path, but we both noticed something was different. There was a weird noise, and it sounded like a screaming animal. The animal screamed, then paused, then screamed again, then paused. Both me and Amanda were very creeped out by this. Something was off about it, though. Like, it was on repeat. The scream sounded exactly the same at all times. And it had a weird screaming sound as well. We got so creeped out that we took out her phone and used it as a flashlight and held each other close and sang my favorite song, Good Loving by Benjamin and Grosso. When we had walked a little longer, we both noticed the sound got louder and louder. Now, as I'm about to shit myself, I just wanted to run back to camp or her house, but didn't know and didn't want to show my Sally side to Amanda. We passed the place where the sound was the loudest. It was like sound was right next to me. After a while, we were very close to camp, and I noticed she pointed the flashlight to the side of the woods. I yelled, don't light into that woods. Uh, she lit it up in front of us. I got satisfied, but I noticed she was very uneasy. We got back to the tent, and as soon as we set foot into it, it was like someone was grabbing my back. I looked back and nothing. We sat inside. I noticed Amanda was a little uneasy, and she told me what was bothering her. This is exactly how she told it to me. You see, when I lit up into the woods, I saw something. I saw two eyes. It was like when you take a picture at someone with the flash and their pupils become red. That's how it was. Also, the creature was like four meters tall, and it looked like it was moving slowly towards us. As soon as I yelled at her, the creature ran away. Even I heard the running sounds, but before she told me this, I didn't think much of it. I don't know what to say. Am I paranoid and overthinking this? Should I do something? I've been reading about creatures and cryptids, and I'm not sure this was one. I don't know. Today's next encounter is just a little bit of Native American lore. So this story didn't happen to me, but I heard it many times when I was growing up. My grandparents owned 80 acres about 20 miles east of Snowflake, Arizona. They had moved to the land in the early 80s after my granddad had retired from the mine in San, Man San Manuel, Arizona. The land was pretty barren. I don't know why they chose to buy it. Red stand bluffs, dry wash cut across the landscape, dotted with juniper and cedar trees, and red sand everywhere. I suppose at the time the land was cheap. They didn't have close neighbors. The closest was about a mile away, which was my aunt and my uncle. The closest neighbor was a man named Stoddard. I never got his first name, just Stoddard. He lived about four miles from my grandparents at the base of one of the sandstone bluffs. He was an asshole rancher, from what my grandparents said. He thought that he owned everything and was entitled to do what he wanted. More than once, my granddad had caught Stoddard cutting my grandfather's barbed wire fence to let his cattle onto my granddad's property to graze. 
Now, this area is full of ancient Anasazi Pueblo ruins. Most of them had been destroyed by ranchers with backhoes trying to find pots to sell. I'm sure Stoddard was one of them. So the story goes, one day after losing a calf, Stoddard stumbles upon a cave sealed with a giant slab of sandstone against one of the sides of the bluff. Curious about this, he used his backhoe to remove the boulder. After going inside, he discovers it's an Anasazi burial cave. I'm sure he was delighted. He starts taking things from the burial cave and selling them. Well, from that moment on, he had some pretty bad luck. First, he lost about a half a million dollars in the stock market. Then his cattle all got diseased and died. In financial ruins, he gets another blow. His wife gets diagnosed with an extremely rare disease and passes away. Then Stoddard gets thrown from his horse and loses his ability to walk. This all happens within a couple of years. He tells everyone he knows that he's cursed from that Anasazi burial ground. They laugh it off. Stoddard puts all the artifacts back that he still had and seals the cave back up with a boulder. He abandons all his belongings and leaves one night. This was in the late 80s. Fast forward a couple of years since Stoddard abandoned his ranch house, the land and house are bought by a man in California. He puts the ranch house up for rent. My aunt is pregnant with her first son and decides to move from San Manuel to Snowflake to be closer to his parents. Stoddard's house was fully furnished. My aunt and her husband moved in. He finds a job working nights at the local paper mill. It's very creepy out there at night. At first, it seems like a nice place. Creepy at night, but not too bad. Then, the weird stuff starts happening. My aunt starts hearing faint chanting and drums at night. She brushes it off. She had a hippie neighbor that lived about a mile away on the bluff, so she figured it must be doing them doing their hippie stuff. But she can't help feeling like someone or something was watching her all of the time. She starts having nightmares every night, but chalks it up to just being alone and hormones. She finally tells my grandpa about it, and he loans her his dog to keep her company at night. She drives the dog out there, and he refuses to get out of the truck. The hair on the back of his neck stands straight up, and he's growling. She gets freaked out, but figures he must have saw a rabbit or something, and hauls him into the house. The dog just stares at the door, growling. That night, he growls and barks all night. The drums and chanting are louder. The next morning, my aunt finds human bare feet around the house. So this goes on for about a week. The dog barks and growls at night, nightmares when she does sleep. Footprints in the morning, chanting and drums keep getting louder. Finally, feeling like she's losing her mind, she asks my grandma to come over and stay the night with her. Grandma's more than happy. After finishing her choice, she heads over and plans on making a nice meal for my aunt. This is late afternoon. My aunt lays down for a nap comfortably now that my grandma is there. Grandma decides to take a little walk at the base of the bluff. My grandma's a very religious person. Now, my grandmother is a very religious person. She's very active in church and devoted her life to Jesus Christ. As she goes on her little walk, she likes to look for pottery shards and arrowheads a little ways from the house. She gets a very unnerving feeling that something is watching her. She said it made her skin crawl. She could do something evil, so my grandparent grandma prays and walks back to the house pleading the blood of Christ. She decides not to say anything to my aunt, who is awake because she's already frightened. She tells my aunt maybe it's a better idea to stay at her house tonight. My aunt agrees. By the time my aunt gets her stuff together, the sun is about to set behind the bluff. Grandma, my aunt, and the dog all loaded up in the pickup. Grandma turns the key and nothing. She tries again. Nothing. Not being very mechanically inclined, Grandma goes into the house and calls my grandpa, but he doesn't answer. She remembers he was going into town. Dang. They unload it and go back into the house and wait for Grandpa to get home. It's night now, no moon, pitch black, the dogs began to growl. The sounds of chanting and the drums begin, faint at first, but growing louder. My Grandma begins to pray in between calling Grandpa. Remember, this is the time before cell phones. They hear something howl outside, not a coyote howl, 
something more ominous and terrifying. Something was moving just beyond the reach of the porch light. Both women are beyond terrified at this point. Finally, after turbo-dialing Grandpa, he finally answers. My grandma's frantic. Alvin, something's outside of the house. Get here now. For what seems like hours, they wait for Grandpa's truck to come over the hill. Finally, they see the headlights. Before Grandpa flies into the driveway, something runs across the road in front of him. The headlights illuminate the animal. Grandpa jumps out of the truck, yelling for the women to get the hell in. He unloads a couple of shots in the general vicinity of the animal. They haul ass down the dirt road towards their house. My aunt, against the better judgment, looks back and sees red eyes watching them. The next day, my grandpa and my uncle head over to the house. Grandpa verified that all around the house there were bare footprints in the sand, along with a very large canine tracks. Needless to say, my aunt and grandma never went back to that house. My aunt won't even talk about it. I made the mistake of staying up late one night and listening to the adults talk. My aunt moved in with my grandparents. My grandma swears that she would have seen those red eyes at night stalking the edge of property. As far as I know, other people have tried living at Stoddard's house but leave within a month or so. The whole area, I believe, is cursed. I've always hated going out there. It's a very oppressive feeling of evil, even in my grandparents. Today's final encounter. I'll preface this long story by saying that I've spent a lot of time with Native Americans and their culture history is really important to me. My dad grew up on the border near the Res in Alaska and was adopted by a family of the Inuit. And I spent a good amount of time with a friend who is Lakota. At the time of this incident, a friend and I were leaving Standing Rock, North Dakota after being there for about six weeks to drive home to Texas. We, for some reason, decided to go and see Mount Rushmore on our way back. And after being at Standing Rock for so long, we were very sour taste in our mouth, seeing American president's face carved into the mountains that were straight up stolen from the natives. So my friend decides that we're going to go to Wounded Knee. It's a few hours out of the way, but it's really important. Side note, it's about 11 at night at this point, but screw it. I was planning to drive straight through to Texas anyway. We should go and pay our respects especially after being at Rushmore. Fast forward, GPS takes us straight to the main part, the gravestones and the monument, plus a bunch of descriptive signs. I've never believed in ghost spirits or any of that hoopla, but as soon as we parked, I was seized with a terrible fear. Can't move, refuse to get out of the car, struggling not to have a panic attack. Get the F out of here kind of fear. My friend gets out of the car and goes to read the memorials. I sit in the car, literally paralyzed with fear and terror. I look out the window and see two giant black dogs with red eyes. They're looking directly at me. All I could feel was this oppressive feeling that was almost a thought that we do not belong here in the word leave. We maintain eye contact as I literally start to shake and feel the most horrible feeling of sense of dread I have ever felt. Also, for the record, I'm a really tough lady. It takes a lot for me to get ruffled. I lay on the horn, and once my friend returns to the car, I tell her we need to get the hell out of here and now. I don't tell her what's going on. I just type Texas into the GPS with shaking hands and start to drive. Following the instructions, I leave, taking a bunch of turns, the roads I don't remember from the way in. And after about five minutes, we ended up right back at the exact same place at Wounded Knee that we were just at. Right then, feeling legitimate actual terror and trying not to lose my shit I tell my friend what's going on she happened to be a stupid hippie who believes in shit like spirits and crystals and whatever and she took me seriously she pulls out her phone GPS did the same thing to her all I feel is dread and I can't see those eyes out of my head I decided to trust my hound dog senses at this point and just drive as far away as I can 
My friend insists we throw off all the jewelry that we're wearing, and I drove in a clammy terror for at least an hour before I felt okay to speak. I still don't know exactly what we saw or what happened, but it still unnerves me. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. All right, folks, there you have it. This early morning or middle of the night bonus. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps the channel growing and going, and honestly, what gives people a chance and a place to share their experiences and theories judgment-free, just simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Thank you. Please, everyone, stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.